do with our public services and what do public services mean to us? Um, and then what will we do about it? Um, we have a fantastic panel this morning and um, each of them in their own right could be their keynote speaker. Um, so instead we're going to put them all together, get some great ideas going and then afterwards we're going to get an opportunity, you're going to get an opportunity to ask some questions um, so we can get some discussion going on the topics that are brought up. First we have uh, Ricardo Acuna who is from the Parkland Institute. Um, you will have read his work, you would have seen him, he is in the news often, talking about the importance. Um, he, he talks on the research of these issues that are so important to us. Um, he, Political and Economic Research Institute at the U of A is one of the founding reasons why we can go out there and argue with what we argue with good evidence. So, Ricardo, please come forward and share your knowledge. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, so it's Saturday morning, and uh, I'm standing up here, and still not entirely sure what it is we're doing. Larry, uh, <laughs> something about connecting dots. So I'm going to go with Larry's direction. Uh, I often go with Larry's direction because you know he's, he's like this big uh, symphony conductor who's so good at moving things in specific directions. And Larry suggested that I start by referencing the picture on the back of. Uh, the Priorities for Change document. And uh, Larry said to me before we came up that this is what we're doing here this morning. It is, um, we're talking about how these big three themes that we're discussing, revenue reform, public services, and stronger democracy, actually fit in to the work we're doing, the work we want to do going forward, and that the idea this morning is that we're going to draw a bit of a link from the discussions yesterday around what is it we want to the discussions today about how do we get there. So, um, they asked the guy who does a non-advocacy uh, research institute work to come up and talk about action planning, which is maybe not the best bet, but we're going to give it a shot. And um, where I'm going to start is actually by uh, talking about a theory that was developed, uh, and uh, I know many of you have heard me talk about this before, so feel free to ignore the next few minutes. Um, about a theory that was developed uh, by a guy by the name of Joe Overton, who uh, was very highly placed uh, with an extreme right think tank in the US called the Mackinac Center. And um, what Joe Overton did was develop a theory that he called uh, the window of political possibilities. And according to Overton, if you take all of the public policy ideas, possibilities that exist on any one issue at any point in time and you put them on a spectrum, whether you call that spectrum left-wing and right-wing or socialist and capitalist or collectivist and individualist, whatever you call it, if you take all of the ideas, all of the possibilities on public policy and put them on the spectrum, at any point in time there's a window on that spectrum. And it's within that window that little box, that the ideas that are considered reasonable, rational, possible, and plausible reside. That's where public policy gets made. That's where a majority of the population is in terms of these ideas. That's what they believe. That's where the politicians live, for the most part, is inside that window, because they want to be where the people are in terms of how they frame their ideas. What Overton says, said, is that you can move the window and that you can expand the boundaries of the window. And the way you do that is by flooding the public discourse with ideas from outside the window. Ideas that seem unreasonable, impractical, illogical, radical, unthinkable. You take these unthinkable ideas and start flooding the public discourse with them. And the first time people hear ideas, they're going to say, oh, that's not practical, that's not reasonable, that's unthinkable, we could never do that. Second time they hear that, they'll probably think the same thing. By the time they've heard it a hundred times in a week, they're going to start to think, hey, maybe there's something to this. Maybe this makes some sense. And at that point, the window has moved. Because that idea has gone from the realm of being unthinkable to the realm of being plausible. So, if you take a look at what's happened in Alberta, not just in Alberta, but across North America in the last 40 years, 
It's been exactly that exercise. The window has been moved. And it's been moved by a set of ideas that 40 years ago were considered unthinkable and implausible being flooded into our public discourse day after day after day. Some of these ideas include that uh, taxation is bad, taxation is theft. That government is too large, that government is ineffective. That the private sector is the ultimate form of efficiency. That there should be no government regulation on anything the private sector does. These are the ideas that we've heard over and over and over and over again for the last 40 years. So what's happened is that the window, in terms of our big picture political context, has shifted over those 40 years significantly to the right. And the interesting thing about this is that when you look at this theory of the Overton window, you come to realize that politicians don't lead. Politicians follow. I often describe politicians as being the folks walking around looking for a parade that they can jump in front of. Right? Because ultimately what politicians are doing is they're out there trying to get elected. And the way they get elected is by embracing ideas that are considered popular and reasonable. The challenge is that that's not how change happens. Change doesn't happen from within the window. If all we're doing is putting forth ideas and discussing ideas that are reasonable, that people are not going to object to, that people are going to accept as possible, then we're not going to get change. The change happens on the fringes. The change happens when we start presenting ideas that a majority of folks will consider unthinkable. That's how we get the window to move. That's how the right got the window to move. By flooding us with these ideas, by giving us the Dave Rutherfords and the Lauren Gunters and the Ezra Levants and letting them speak to us endlessly, by putting people like Danielle Smith in major newspapers, in think tanks, and letting them speak to us constantly with these ideas that literally 40 years ago were radical, radical ideas. And today form the base of what's considered common sense in our province around public policy. So, how do we get there? How do we make it happen? Which I think is actually the title of this panel, Making It Happen. Well, it's upon us to push those boundaries. It's upon us to present challenging and radical ideas. In his book, The Truth About Stories, Thomas King says, the truth about stories is that's all we are. If you want a different outcome, tell a different story. I like the way Tom King words that much better than the way Joe Overton worded it. Um, but that's our challenge, is to tell a different story and not to be shy about the story we tell. Not to worry about, if I tell this story, people are going to think I'm ridiculous. If I tell this story, people are going to think I'm radical. If I tell this story, nobody's going to listen to me. They're going to laugh at me. Because if there's enough of us telling those stories, if there's enough of us telling a new story, then eventually we're going to be able to move the window. That's how we see our work at the Parkland Institute. We see our work as pushing the envelope. The research we do, we're not concerned about fitting into the, co the prominent dialogue at any point in time. What we want to do is talk about what could be. <coughs> and talk about it as much as we can, in as many places as we can, and try to get into the media, and talk to folks like you, and say, this is what's possible. Our hope being that if we say that enough, and you all say that enough, then eventually that window will start to move. And as the window starts to move, the politicians will start to follow. And as the politicians start to follow, we finally start to get some public policy that makes sense for the rest of us. So that's the goal. So how are we doing with that today? Because 
I spent some time reading my paper this morning before coming down here and trying to find examples of where exactly we are. What stories are we telling? And it's not terribly positive in terms of the stories we're telling because we're working so hard to fit within that window that we're not challenging anybody or anything. And our language is actually hurting our causes. We're not talking about what we want. We're starting by talking about how we're going to pay for it. And I know I'm supposed to be up here talking about revenue reform. And I'm telling you that that's not what we should be leading with. We should be leading with the stories of what we want. The public services we want. The collective common goods we want. The kind of society we want to live in. Tell that story. Get people on side with that story. And once we've told that story, then we sit around and we say, okay, how do we pay for it? And when we talk about how we pay for it, we need to do a better job telling that story than we're telling it now. Because if what we want is the public services we have now, and I argue that that's not what we want, we want something far, far better than that. But if what we want are the public services, the common goods that we have in Alberta right now, then the reality is we're seven and a half billion dollars short of paying for those services every year. And if we're seven and a half billion dollars short of paying for those services every year, our story can't be about taxing the rich and taxing the corporations. Our story needs to be about the fact that none of us in this room is paying enough through our taxes to pay for our public services. That needs to be our story. So when we frame our story, around discussions of we need to tax the rich more and we need to tax corporations more, this reinforces the sense that we don't need to pay anymore. This reinforces this fact that we don't want to pay anymore in taxes. When Jim Prentice passes his budget and introduces a bunch of ridiculous new user fees and charges and surcharges because he's afraid to introduce new taxes because of where the Overton window is, our response can't be, why are we paying more for everything? Our response should be, yes, we need to pay more for everything, but we need to do it in a better, more intelligent way. And the way to do that is progressive taxation, and we all need to pay more. If I'm going to stand up here, if I'm going to stand up here and say to you, we're not paying enough for our taxes, but don't tax me anymore, then I'm completely contradicting my case. Right? We need to tell those stories better. We need to remind people of where the concept of taxation comes from and how closely aligned it is with the concept of democracy. Because the frame that we've inherited from the right, the frame that we've bought into is one of theft, of government being over there and of us giving our money or government taking our money to some other place and using it for their priorities. And we've stopped telling the story about how this actually works is that these people that we've elected to speak on our behalf and move our interests forward are stewarding our money in ways to pay for things that we've identified as priorities. I do a lot of talking to uh, high school kids about this stuff. And one of the things I use to explain to them um, how taxes work, and I've got to keep an eye on my clock here, um, is I give them this story of uh, an imaginary block. Imagine there's a block. We all live on a block, right? Um, and we've just built this block, and our road is still made of dirt and mud. And when it rains, it's impossible uh, to drive, to do anything on the road. You can't walk on it, you can't drive on it because it's flooded. In winter, the road is a mess. Uh, you vehicles are always stuck on it. It's wrecking our vehicles because it's all rocks and it's all mud. So everybody on the block decides, we need to pave the road around our block. So everybody goes off to pave the road around the block. And my friend on the corner who's really, really wealthy, works in the oil patch, says, I'm going to pave the piece of block in front of my house in gold. <laughs> and then my other friend on the other corner who's currently out of work says, I, I can't afford to pave the piece of road in front of my house. I'm just going to have to leave it how it is. And what we wind up is this block where the one corner is paved in gold, the other one is gravel, the other one's got some dirt and oil sprinkled on it, the other one's got nothing on it. And our problem on our block is not solved. Because, you know what, my car still gets stuck when I drive by the piece of my block that hasn't been paved at all. My car's still getting wrecked because there's no work done on this road. 
What taxes are, is all the people on that block coming together and saying, you know what, let's all pitch in. Let's pool our money. Let's get a constant grade of road built around our block. You on the corner with the five cars are going to use that road a lot more than the rest of us will. So we're going to ask you to pay a little more for this road. Right? right? And you over there, I know you're out of work right now, but you know what? It's in our interest to have the road in front of your block, in front of your house paved. So we're going to make sure that that piece of road gets paved as well. We're all going to pool our money together. We're going to pay for one contractor to come out and do it. They're going to pave our road. That's what taxes are. And we do it with health care and with education. We do it with all of it. We need to tell that story again. We have to stop reinforcing these frames as taxes, as theft of taxes, as bad. Taxes are an expression of our collective will. That's the story we need to tell. That's how we get from the values, from the things we want, to where we want to be. Tell those stories. Tell them often. Let's move that window back to where it belongs in this province, and let's make the change happen. I'll stop there. Thank you. I think one uh, way we can really see how this Overton window has shifted is how often I get described as a taxpayer, which I am not. I'm a citizen, and I will pay so that we are all citizens and have responsibilities to this province. So stop accepting being called a taxpayer. That's just an action that we have as part of it. Um, okay. Next speaker, we have Elizabeth Ballerman, who is the president of the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. She leads, has led this uh, organization for um, a little bit. I won't give you the time, but you can look it up in your book. Um, and this is a very active and uh, wonderful union that has done great work for its members, but also for the broader public. And that has been under Elizabeth's uh, leadership. Elizabeth, no further ado, please join us. Tall people. <laughs> How's that? Did that come through all right? Okay, good. I don't want to call. Okay, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. I too will start my timer here so that I respect your time. Thank you. And you know, you may still have to give me the hook or wherever we go. Hard act to follow. Really hard act to follow. So I've been asked to talk about public services, and Ricardo's of course already touched on that and used almost <coughs> the exact analogy I was going to use to say that I can't afford to pave the road in front of my house. But let me just give you another little thing. My trip in from the south side today. Uh, anybody notice any potholes in our road? <laughs> <laughs> so if the city says I need to pay another hundred dollars a year in taxes and we pay those damn potholes and I don't have to repair the struts in my car for six or seven hundred dollars, gee, if we don't want to talk the economic language of the right of return on investment, that to me is a pretty darn good return on investment and we can actually get to work on time and you know, all those things. So, um, th those are just so important when we talk about public services. My union, of course, is the Health Sciences Association of Alberta. We represent about 24,000 health professionals who are a really wide range of services. Everything from our EMS professionals, and some of them are in the room today, public health inspectors that you don't really think about, social workers, lab x-ray, uh, physiotherapists, pharmacists, etc. Um, they are all part of the system that provides the key public service that is healthcare to all of us. They are citizens, and by the way, we, they get talked about as if they don't pay taxes, and they are all taxpayers, so that's the last time I'm going to use that word. <laughs> um, we are also part of the National Union of Public and General Employees, which brings together government employees from across the country and has been working darn hard on this question of the common good and uh, good, strong public services. And the reason I'm leading that is I'm going to talk very much and use their stuff, basically, which is our stuff, and cheat on, on the whole thing. Um, so public services, as we've said, you've got the document in front of you. Roads, education, uh, post-secondary education, uh, child care, uh, seniors care, uh, the, the whole gamut. And health care is in there, yes, but we all know that the best health care that we're going to get is to address the social determinants of health, right? 
So you are going to, and it was said yesterday, but repetition is really good for us adults, especially those of us with failing memories and those of us who know me know that I'm particularly uh, uh, affected by that. You know, so if you have a good education, you have a roof over your head, you have a job, you have good social contacts, uh, you, you know, there, there are about 25 of those social determinants, and healthcare is only a small part of that, where we actually fix the problems that are caused by homelessness, by poverty, by children who are going to school hungry in the morning. And that's where we think it. So if we want to talk about good public services for the common good, Absolutely, I am going to defend and support strong health care because my members would all fire me if I didn't, <laughs> as they should. But they all understand that what comes across, you know, Ed's ambulance when he goes out there, uh, Yvonne's lab when she does the, the testing, uh, Donna, who, who's a respiratory therapist, they know that a lot of the problems they are trying to solve have their origin in the social determinants of health, and we should be striving to do ourselves out of a job. Okay. In, uh, in 2009, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives did a study and I'd invite, it takes a little bit of searching, or at least somebody who's <coughs> smarter than I can probably find it in three seconds. CCPA did this study that said that the average Canadian family gets about $41,000 worth of public services per year. Now, if you do the math, we have a 10% and, and about to have 10.5%, depending on, and, and a little bit, they did it hint of progressing taxation, uh, tax rate, you'd have to have a taxable income of over $100,000 to pay that much in taxes. So for most of us in this room, I suggest to you that our public services are a bargain and we should be happy to, to pay for them. And the, the social determinants of health, the, the things that crime, the poverty that leads to crime, that leads to all the other social ills, if we can fix those for other people, we're going to be that much better. And the income inequality is the other thing that we've heard about all along, as, as that the greater the income inequality, the growing income inequality that we've been seeing in this country has been adding to those social ills. And how many of us heard about the sale of Shell, uh, sorry, the Shell buying some LNG, Latin, uh, liquidified natural gas company, can't remember the name of the company, $77 billion. Okay. When you want to talk about income inequality, you also heard about the CEO of the company that they are buying, who has been there for an entire two months, who is walking away with how much? <coughs> $43 million dollars for two months of service. <laughs> CBC suggested he has barely had time to polish the desk. Forty-three million dollars. Now who created that wealth for that person to get forty-three million dollars after two months of work? It was not that man. Could have been a woman, but unlikely. Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did he create $43 million of worth of wealth for anybody? No, but because of his lofty position. It's the worker who's out there, whatever else you may think about, about uh, the fossil fuels, etc. But those workers who are out there in the mud and slogging in the worst of the worst, uh, who, are, who are digging that oil out of the ground, who are transporting it, who are risking their lives with explosions, those are the people who create the wealth. And don't you ever let anybody forget that. Because... Thank you. We heard about charter schools yesterday. We now are hearing about social impact bonds. And I invite you to go to the National Union's uh, website, nupge.ca. They've got a ton of documents on there that'll help you with, with uh, stuff. And I want to just take you briefly through the analysis that we've done, and I, because I want to uh, take five minutes of my time to show you a little video that also comes from, uh, from Nupji. All of you have got this document on your, on your table somewhere. I invite you to just follow along with me. This is the analysis to make it easy for the rest of the world to understand why, why we need to change the analysis. So if you look at the side that is primarily red, this is what we call 
the 1% approach. And you'll notice there's a similarity between my t-shirt and the bus. Okay. Last summer, we in Alberta and our national union across the country took a great big green bus. Some of you hopefully saw it, but you might not have because it was deliberately intended to go where our usual crowd doesn't go, to have conversations with Albertans about and with Canadians about income inequality and what, what cre creates that, right? So, tax fairness. We've heard a lot about that. We need tax fairness. We need to pay our fair share. My members pay me very well, and if I have to pay a little bit more tax to make sure all of us get good services, I agree absolutely with Ricardo. I think we need to examine where we sit on that scale and not be afraid to, to pay a little bit more to ensure that those who have so much less uh, have something, right? Uh, then they attack our public services, we heard all about that, and you're going to hear about it a little bit more, and you create more income inequality. We have no industrial strategy. We've been talking again and again and again about how all we're depending on is drawing the drawers of, of water and the hewers of wood, as it's, as it's traditionally said, but our resources. We dig the stuff out of the ground. Do we create any value after that? We ship our trees in, in ships to China so that China can turn them into two-by-fours and send them back to us. I mean, is that crazy or what? What does that do to our environment as we burn the fossil fuel to get those trees over there and then ship them back? I mean, environmentally, it's just ridiculous. So then we ship our jobs offshore. You've seen the, the, the uh, loss of industrial jobs of, of manufacturing. And we create McJobs. You've seen the stats recently about the job creation that we're losing full-time jobs, we're losing good, strong-paying jobs to part-time casual jobs and to, to McJobs, right? So the, you, know, you can aspire to work at Tim Hortons. And then we have the attack on labor rights. In 20 years, we've had over 200 pieces of legislation that have been passed that attack labor rights. And even though this month we had one in Alberta that was passed that is arguably good for labor, those of us in unions, <laughs> Bill 45, well, thank you a whole heck of a lot, something that was going to be found to be unconstitutional in any case, right? So nominally it's, uh, but you know, the, the, the back to work legislation before a strike has even happened. In what, in what uh, universe do we, do we do that sort of thing? So our attacks have been, uh, um, uh, on labor rights have been great. And we've lost union density. Unions matter to everybody, so even if you're not in a union, you're benefiting from the benefits of unions. <laughs> and again, the Parkland did a great study talk, uh, called Unions Matter. CCPA has done a book that call, that's called Unions Matter. And when people tell you that unions have outlived their, their usefulness, don't let them tell you that and, and tell them why it matters. So I'm going to take you to the green side. It's the actual, the absolute reverse of that analysis of this is what fairness would really look like. And that's where I'm going to stop and I'm going to invite, ask uh, who's running our AV? We have a really neat little animated thing that, uh, that Nukji has done that says it much more eloquently than I can. So thank you very much and I look forward to the conversation. values are at the top of the list. Fairness, empathy, responsibility, equality. These values speak volumes about the character of our country. Canadians care about each other. We believe everyone deserves a fair shot at building a good life. Larry Dewey, who is a, um, a long-time advocate for the public service um, in all of its forms, um, is the past chair of Public Interest Alberta. Um, but I think today I learned the best description of him I've ever heard, which is um, for you to welcome our symphony director and our symphony <laughs> conductor, uh, Larry Bowie. <laughs> Thank you very much.
much for that. I, my worry was when he said conductor, I, I thought he was going to say, Here, here's Larry, who is, who is a conductor who tells you where to sit. You know, so this is an infinitely better uh, view. I, I like the video very much, by the way, and, and the five points. But I would, my reaction at the end was, that's really good. But I'd add point six and seven. And point six is there'll be no further privatizations, and point seven would be, and we will systematically work to reverse the privatizations that I exist. In that. In the business. So that's the great thing when people do these sorts of things. You can take them and use them and build on them. Um, I, I think the question for your session following, and really why we're here, is um, what are we going to do? So what are we going to do? We share a lot of values, we share passions and concerns about these things. So, so out of all the things that we could be doing, what, what are we going to do? Particularly on May 6th. Because May 5th is the election, uh, the quasi-democratic enterprise that passes is that in Alberta. And then May 6th is presumably another four years, not necessarily of one particular government, but, but another four years, right? And so these elections are a terrific opportunity to use for, for your purposes. But the real issue is what are we going to be doing after that election? And that's kind of what we tried to address. First of all, yeah, actually we tried to do two things with this document. And you, you, have to, you have to have progressive lenses. So those of you with my hair color already have them. But put on progressive lenses for a moment. And one, first of all, you look at the short term, which is the next few weeks, and a terrific opportunity to influence an election and a process that has something to do with all the issues that we've been doing with. And then you look at the longer term stuff, Right? And you say, okay, immediately May 6th and following, what are we going to be doing? So what we tried to do is give you a resource in here that will help you in this election process to say, these are the top priorities. And if you don't like those priorities, you know, like shape them, obviously, as you are, always do. But th for this election, these are the top priorities. But, and legitimately, there, there have been comments about it, but this is pretty, not very powerful, overwhelming stuff. That's right, there are three short-term priorities. So then the question becomes, what do you want? How can we use this to build the foundation of what we want after that election, after time? And so when you go into the session, the next session, that's what we're going to be asking you. Okay, so what should we be doing, you as individuals, you and your organization, and above all, how can we help each other to work together to do the things that we all believe in? Okay, And we've tried to say on the back of this document that there seem to be three big pieces. Number one, if we don't get that revenue reform, you can't have the public services that you want and deserve. And then, if you don't have a clear picture of your priorities uh, for the, those public services, you've got to tell them what you want and why. And then the last piece, which is what I, I want to spend a little bit of time this morning on, is how we get there, and that is the, the democracy piece, okay? So this business of using democracy, there, 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 there are two, two pieces to democracy. There's two, way of do, two, two ways of doing politics everywhere, and one of them is the electoral side. That, that is electing good candidates and the opportunities right in front of us, and you have to do that. You can't just say, oh yeah, the policy, I'm not going to do that side, I'm going to do the other side. Other people can do the electoral side. You've got to do the electoral side, otherwise you have to put up with whoever, whoever wins that electoral process. And that's not pretty. Right? <laughs> but the other side of it is, of course, the civil society side, the organization side. right? The working to, to, on the movement side. To, to make a difference. And of course, that's what a lot of this is about. And so, I want to talk mostly about that second way of doing politics. I also want to really agree with Asbjorn that this is about power. You know, like really, that this, that this has to be about not necessarily winning a government, but it has to be about the power to change ideas, and that requires an investment of time and effort in smart and effective ways. And by the way, I love it when people like Asborn, uh, Asborn and others 
as speakers, you notice they come here and they're not like the shooting star syndrome. They don't come in, light up the night, and then disappear into the darkness after. He's here all the time, at every session, you know. And I see our Chicago rep who struggled to get here on the plane right here this morning, even though it's not. It's like, that, that's the kind of commitment that makes things happen. So let me make some quick observations about the, how we have to use our democracy, what there is of it, to get the kind of ends that, that, that we want. And I'm, I'm reminded very much uh, of Václav Havel, uh, who became president of Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic, and before communism collapsed in Europe in 1989-ish and, and following, Havel had actually spent a lot of time as a playwright in jail, right? And then after things fell apart, he ended up as the president of the country. And he had this great observation about democracy. He said, we thought that democracy was the light at the end of the tunnel. And what we found was that democracy was the long tunnel at the end of the light. In other words, the hard work of democracy means doing that work all the time because your opponents, and as Brian talked about this, your opponents are always out there and they're organized and they're pushing in their agenda and they've got money. It's the long tunnel at the end of the light. That's not a bad thing. It's just, it just makes it a serious business of hard work. So I think there are two things about democracy um, in this document and for us to think about. And that is we have to change what passes for democracy in Alberta. And then we have to use what we have as democracy to accomplish the kinds of goals. And it, you know, Alberta, I've said lots and in here, we talk about Alberta being the least democratic place in the country. Uh, we're number one. <laughs> um, Bill Moyers on public television in the United States had a great observation a while ago. And he said, you know, we've got to come to see clearly that government is now no more than a protection racket for the 1%. Uh -huh. yeah. you know? and, and the second observation was inventing in the Edmonton Journal the other day where, where somebody said, the Tory party, a wholly owned subsidiary of yeah. Alberta's oil and gas industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a wonderful observation. And that has to be changed. You know, and our rules are an invitation to dominance by wealthy and corporate interests. You can give $30,000, right? 30000 and they do, lots of them. Look at Jim Prentice's campaign. All of a sudden the money came out of Calgary. And Prentice had over $2.4 million, most of it from corporate sources, a lot of it from $30,000 contributions. And that's legal. That's encouraged. You know, like we, we have to change that. And we have suggestions about campaign and party finance in here. But until we get that turned around, we're just going to have a bit of a tougher fight. We'll keep doing it. But campaign and party finance, no spending limits. Alberta is the only jurisdiction in the country, no spending limits. Spend anything you want, and they do. Get ready, watch it, it's coming at you in ads, right? We also have to work towards democratic reform on the electoral side. Like, the fact that you can consistently get elected with a government with 38% of the votes is an offense to the principle of majority government. And the fact that you can elect, you can have 15% of the vote and not get a single candidate elected in the province is an offense to minority rights. Both of those are offenses to democracy. And so it's, it's not like all over the place they change those things. We've got proposals in here. But I guess what I'm saying is I really believe that we have to make democratic reform a priority in the agenda for all of us. Now, let me just for, make a couple of quick comments about the, the second side of this, the using the civil society side, to the organizations, to get what you want. You're already doing it. I mean, we, the, the, from 10 years ago, your organizations that you've put together, workers who have unions, unions who have put together the Alberta Federation of Labor, the uh, individual members who are, are telling, you know, the, the health sciences, the reason they do that is they get permission and support from their members, otherwise they can't do it. You're doing all of this, you're encouraging these organizations. 
If you look at Parkland, who, for example, just recently gave us that terrific study of income tax and all the evidence about how to change it to progressive income. Kathleen Leahy's, right? And all sorts of other good things. Friends of Medi Medicare who go around the province holding these hearings on seniors care and, and uh, Noel Somerville, ever fresh, ever young, at the heart of that from seniors organizations. <laughs> set up these organizations. You set them up and you fund them and, and, and in your own organizations, you know, you get health sciences and nurses and others supporting that terrific campaign by the Federation of Labor, right, on, on, on a better way. So powerful that they had to shut it down. You know, now that's a testimonial to your work. We have the Teachers Association who funded the Alberta Good Campaign, where we floated that idea. Like most of that money came from the Alberta Teachers Association, the College of Social Workers, who have worked so hard on a comprehensive approach to poverty reduction. You know, just a, a terrific effort. And all of these efforts by your organizations working together, not trying to duplicate, trying to sort things out, help each other out. That's what this is about. That's what we're trying to do here. That's why we set up Public Interest Alberta in the first place. Not to replace anybody, but to add a little value by making it easier to bring your organizations together and give you maybe a few additional resources to help you do your work in your organizations, right? And in your organizations of organizations. I, I thought, you know, it was really interesting in Abby's speech, um, he was talking about that saying yes and saying no and coalitions and energy and I thought I thought back to when we started Public Interest Alberta and it was really strange. I've got a copy of the New Left Review of May, of, uh, May June 2001 and there was an article by Naomi Klein called Reclaiming the Commons and I was reading this in the summer of 2001 and it's very quick, you give, you, you give you a quick sense of it. She, said, she talks about what, what's needed, now this is 2001 I think it's more accurate to picture a movement of many movements, coalitions of coalitions. Thousands of groups are working against forces whose common thread is what, what might broadly be described as the privatization of every aspect of life and the transformation of every activity and value into a commodity. And then she goes a little further in 2001. And her view is, it seems to be precisely what you're trying to do. It's not trying to get everybody doing one thing. It's trying to get people who know their own situations to do their own things in more smart and cooperative and effective ways, right? And that's what it's really about. So here's how she kind of, oh yeah. What we need is to formulate a political framework that can both take on corporate power and control and empower local organizing and self-determination. That has to be a framework that encourages, celebrates, and fiercely protects the right to diversity, cultural diversity, ecological diversity, agricultural diversity, and yes, political diversity as well. Different ways of doing politics. Communities must have the right to plan and manage their schools, their services, their natural settings according to their own lights. Of course, this is only possible within the framework of national and international standards of public education, fossil fuel initials, and so on. But the goal should not be better far away rules and rulers. It should be close up democracy on the ground. Hmm. I think that's a terrific recipe. And by the way, that includes the arts. Would you, if you were lucky enough to be here last night, wow. you know, the artists are able to give their insights in ways that touch different parts of your brain. And one of the reasons why we've tried to do that is this is the part of that diversity in that community that can make that kind of difference. So I think it's obvious, you know. Uh, Noel Somerville and I have this <laughs> motto about action, and that is it's a triple A task, a triple A task. Get more angry, get more active, get more allies, right? That's what we do. So keep on doing it, only more, and work together, and we'll do this thing. Thanks very much.
um, we're going to take work, groups like Parkland, to actually be able to have a conversation about taxes again in this province, in the yeah. public, right? It's a slow moving thing. We have to keep on it. And just because we may not be around to see the results doesn't mean that it's not worth, worth doing. Um, that's one of the reasons that uh, Parkland and a lot of the unions in the room and in Public Interest Alberta have invested so much into the Next Up uh, Leadership Program, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a program for uh, young people aged 18 to 32 who are passionate about social and environmental justice. And it's a program that brings them together and talks about these things, but connects them to movements, connects them to people in the community, and starts moving that forward for a next generation. Um, and it's a powerful thing to be able to pass these stories along, and the program revolves around storytelling. Um, Harold Neff, who asked the question about the 1% not doing their fair share, was actually one of my social studies teachers uh, many years ago when we were both 15. So uh, <laughs> it, does, it does pay forward, right? I mean, we, we find ourselves working together on, on many of these issues now, which is, is really something to see. Um, yes, the 1% have not been doing their fair share, but I think when um, we tell our stories, uh, our stories should be about ourselves. So yes, the 1% have not been doing their fair share in this province to pay for their bills. Absolutely. I haven't been doing my fair share in terms of paying my taxes to adequately support public services either. I think we need to tell both sides of that story. It, it, I think it frames us poorly when we stand up and say they need to do more. Whether it's activism, whether it's taxes, whether it's organizing, whatever it is. Whenever we stand up and say they need to do more, I think it frames us poorly. So I think we need to move forward on that. Um, Last one I'm going to talk about is the irresponsible use of our taxes. Absolutely, but I think there's two separate stories there, right? There's one story about uh, how do we get our public services right, right? How do we make sure that our public services are as effective and as efficient as possible? The other side of that story is how do we fix our democratic structures? How do we fix transparency and accountability to make sure that we are getting the best bang for a buck. I think those are two separate stories. And what's happened is that these frames from the right have used these things of expense claims, of, of airplanes, of, of palace suites, of all this stuff, to reinforce this frame that government is bad, government is inefficient, government is irresponsible, to turn us against this notion of government as a collective expression of ourselves. And I think that that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous that we reinforce it. Really, in the big picture, absolutely, Mike Duffy, horrible. Horrible in government, horrible expenses, horrible all of that. But take that $90,000 check and compare it in the big picture to the millions and billions that we're giving away to the oil companies and that we're blowing on other things, and it's peanuts, right? Yes, it's important to fix that, but let's not focus on that because we do ourselves and our cause a disservice when we reinforce that message about government being bad. following you. <laughs> you steal all my greatest ideas. What he said. Um, and let me just uh, just make sure. Uh, Harold, absolutely. Yeah. We'll feed that back. But I would suggest that the circle that goes to the analysis that says this is what you got to look at before you privatize anything, I would suggest to you that invariably it is going to lead you to the fact that privatization is not going to serve us well. The only thing it will do, it will cut our services, it will cost more, it will put money into profits, and the workers who are providing those essential services will be paid less or lose out on their pensions or all of the above. So I think uh, the, the point is well taken, but I, I think invariably you're going to lead the analysis to you shouldn't be privatizing this stuff. I absolutely also uh, uh, support the idea that, that we don't want to use our public funds irresponsibly and we need to look for opportunities not to do so. In healthcare, we keep hearing about all those terrible people that clog up our emergency departments when they've just got the sniffles. Well, they're not there because they want to be there, by and large. They're there because they have no other options, right? So that's another example of the right framing uh, as, as abuse, something that results from poor uh, execution of public services. And so we need to, uh, I absolutely uh, agree with Ricardo, that if I was a conspiracy theorist, I would almost say that the Mike Duffy case <coughs> is actually there to make us all even less willing to pay our taxes because it is, it is something that, that you can identify with. $90,000 you can identify with. $3 billion, you, it's really hard to figure out what that looks like in the, in yeah. the big scheme of things, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then as far as uh, uh, Enica, 
as someone of German descent, even some Germans have a really good uh, non conservative <laughs> perspective. <laughs> so I think I think we're on the same page there. Uh, and then the the speaker with regard to talking about individuals versus community. It is so, so important that we that we use the word communities, that we use us and we, not me and you. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it's, it's a careful balance. Within my membership, we know that. If, if a member says to me, so if I don't benefit in the end, uh, you know, what's all this good for? And so it, it is one of those, those on the knife's edge, figure out how to balance that, making sure that ultimately, what is good for our communities that our members see that as being good for all of us individually as well. So, um, that's it. As you sat here nervously between the Germans and the Dutch, <laughs> uh, I, I comment on two things. Uh, first of all, the very legitimate concern about uh, inefficiencies, waste, um, stealth uh, in, in all of our systems, but particularly the healthcare system. I, I believe it has something to do with the lack of democratic control within and above the organizations and the institutions. And, and so, for example, uh, the RNs, the LPNs, the care aides, the people who deliver these services, they know what's needed in our session yesterday <laughs> Two people talked about, uh, they were checking out how the copiers were being used and there were three people sent out to do it and one, one to, to look and one to write it down and the other one to watch the two of them doing it, right? <laughs> and I mean, it was so obvious <laughs> to the nurses who were there, right? So we have a system that is incredibly top-down, it's like our political system, it's a top-down system. And this concept of democracy, it doesn't mean you have to hold votes in places. But smart institutions, smart service delivery organizations, listen to their frontline people. And they're, they, they take their insights. And I'll tell you, if you listen to the frontline people, a lot of the inefficiencies are going to go away. One of the problems is it will be at the expense of the people yeah, yeah. above them, and they don't like that, so they don't ask. So I, more, more democracy, and we, we have to insist on that kind of, I don't want to call it economic democracy, but, but more um, smart engagement of people on the ground. Like in schools, you do the same thing, right? Like if you listen to teachers and educational staff, you'll probably get it right. You probably will. Rather than have Bill Gates give you a lecture on how to use business methods in schools, listen to your frontline people and demand it. The second, uh, the second thing is, I think we have, as we as we move forward into these sessions, right, and as we start planning the next four years, I think I think look this, I think this is what we want or something like it. But we've got to be putting a solid set of priorities in front of people. Here's what we want in healthcare to have a genuinely first-rate public services in, in, in all these areas, right? So if it's not this, make up something better, but use it and front it. But don't ever think that it will convince the politicians. It won't convince them. You know, we keep, with, with, with childcare, we keep thinking that if we would, but like, why can't you guys understand that if you invest more in early learning and childcare, you will save $17 down the line in the healthcare system, in the justice system, in the wealth, all of this. And why don't they get it? Hey, they do get it. But first of all, they don't care. Like a lot of our MLAs, older male MLAs, think that kindergarten is a plot to overthrow the family, let alone childcare, right? And they had their wives at home taking care of the kids yeah. when they were away. So, so like what? And also, you know, you think you can convince them on the health care how much more efficient it is. Do you, these guys are in the business of handing over subsidies to health care, private health care organizations. And do you think they're going to listen to you when it's so much more efficient when effective? They're rewarding their friends. They're handing over, they're giving them subsidies, and then they go and sell these long-term care and other institutions yes. later, and they pocket the subsidy. Yep. You know, it's like saying to a vegetarian, 
you should really consider the virtues of steak and meat for protein. They have a different set of values and a different view of the evidence. Right? These guys are there to protect the wealthy and powerful, and so far, they're doing a damn good job of it. And that's what we have to turn around with more democracy. And I hope in your sessions you'll find the ways to do that. Thank you.